This is 21st Century Reformation at 21stcr.org. Today, uh, I'd like to talk about one of the issues of our day that has become more prevalent, uh, noticed, and uh, a bit of a problem. And until Christ comes, I think we'll be wrestling with this particular issue. And that is matters related to understanding about the law of Moses and the Christian's relationship to that, that issue, to that law. And I say that uh, I think this is of uh, interest to us because we're finding uh, in our experience, and perhaps you are as well, that there is uh, an awful lot of movement these days of folks in the direction of uh, keeping Moses' law that we're talking about, all of the various and sundry requirements and, and so on. Uh, I think that uh, one thing that we've been seeing is that sometimes people are being attracted to our one God message, and that's wonderful, and that's exactly what we would like to see happen. Mm -hmm. So they're coming to that, but then they're coming a bit disillusioned then and saying, oh my goodness, well, the Jews had this thing right about the one God, and sure enough, they did. <laughs> they, they, they've got that part right. They've got terrible problems, but they do have in other ways. But this isn't one of them. They do understand that there is only one who is God. But people are coming to this one God understanding and say, well, if the Jews were right about that, then for goodness sakes, they must be right about keeping the law of Moses, and let's, let's do that. And so that's kind of what we're running into in, uh, in relationship to our website. I fairly uh, often, uh, periodically, I will receive an email from someone saying, I, I de I'm detecting that you don't believe we're supposed to be keeping the law, and that's just terrible. What do you, you know, how do you explain yourself? So, uh, so I guess, uh, if I could uh, entitle today's section, uh, session anything, I would call it uh, some thoughts about how to help your friends on this issue of, about the law. Maybe that they would better understand that. And uh, so today uh, we're going to talk about Moses' law was not eternal. So Moses' law was not eternal. I guess what I got me to thinking about that is I recently saw a Jewish rabbi, one of these fellows, the, the anti-guys, the anti-Christian Jewish rabbi folks who are making their rounds right now. They're just terribly down on Christians and Christianity and they're trying to save the Jews from Christianity. So it's a reaction, I guess, to the Messianic Jews who, uh, who are then crossing over and, and, and become Christians. And, uh, but his, his point was, this particular rabbi was just making this huge point, the law of Moses is eternal. And that's what I have to think about as well. Okay, <laughs> is it? What's that all about? What, what do we mean here? And he just emphasized it's eternal and it's everlasting and so on and so forth. And uh, so that gave rise to this title and to this thought today. And maybe we'll just talk about that a little bit. If you run into that particular question, Maybe you'll be a little better armed, prepared to, uh, to help someone with that issue. There was a time, and this is our thought number one, there was a time when there was no law. And that's not just my idea, but that seems to me to be pretty clearly what the scripture is saying. So uh, if we can begin to kind of put our, our minds to thinking about it, when God made Adam, we have now, the Jewish folks are not going around saying the law of Adam is eternal. They're saying the law of Moses is eternal. So God did not give Adam the law. In fact, uh, my, uh, my associate pastor back in uh, Nashville says God only gave uh, Adam one command and, and he couldn't keep that. He didn't do well, he didn't do well with the one. So uh, I don't know that he would have done very well with the hundreds that are involved with the, with the law of Moses. But, the, uh, but in the beginning, Adam, and here's what I'm thinking about. We go for a long time before we come to this fellow Moses. So here is Adam. 
And how, how much time elapsed from Adam? We, we just said Adam did not have the law. It's not called the law of Adam. It's called the law of Moses. But how much time elapsed between Adam and Moses? Anybody want to take a shot at that? I mean, we're just thinking in round numbers. We, we know that going from Adam to Noah was quite a long distance, wasn't it? It's, uh, what, theorized to be a couple thousand years or something? Okay. Uh, the, the exact numbers don't matter. I'm just trying to get a sense of this. But then from Noah on down to Moses, there's a lot more centuries. There's a lot more, a lot more time there. So we don't know exactly, but what, Moses is 1500s BC, something like that. So, uh, so you've got a lot of time elapsed before we get around to this fellow called Moses. You have then more time elapses, some, some more, not as much as all this back here, in which the law of Moses is really in effect. And that brings us to the time of Christ. Well, if we begin to get a sense of this, we realize that when we're talking about the law of Moses being eternal, we have to realize that that doesn't mean going back in, in, into eternity in that sense at all, because it really wasn't there. You really don't have the law of Moses without Moses. And that's what we want to, to pick up on. So in Romans, the, uh, the fifth chapter, Paul picks up on this idea in, in verses 13 and 14. Paul is making a, sort of another point he's talking, uh, but he makes a very strong point in process about this issue about the law not being before Moses. And what he's saying is, for until, verse 13 of Romans 5, for until the law until the law, so there was a time before that, for until the law, sin was in the world. So sin was in the mind of God. He knew what God, what sin was and, and so on. But the law, this before the law, sin did exist. But notice this. But sin is not imputed, we'll say not counted, when there is no law. So there is a time then before the law. The law comes and then the law is in effect. But he's saying where there is no law, sin is not uh, imputed. I guess that what that means is God's not holding a person accountable for what he hasn't told them uh, that they should or should not do. Interesting. So this is Paul's thought. It's a pretty powerful thought. But here's the rest of it. He says, nevertheless, during this period from Adam to Moses, and that is what he says in verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned. So death was still coming on people, even though there was no law and sin wasn't being imputed. Interesting thought. It, read, read it a little uh, closer when you have time. But what I want to talk about is Paul said there was a time before law and where there was no law. Okay. And I think he has Moses' law in mind in that. So then, let's hear Moses himself for a moment. Moses says in this passage, and many of you will be familiar with this, but in Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter in verse 2, uh, Moses is talking to the people and rehearsing what had happened before when they'd come out of Egypt and when God had given him the law. And uh, Moses says here, the Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. Okay. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us who are all of us here alive this day. So Moses is saying, and by, by the way, by context then, he goes on and starts rehearsing what he received at Horeb including the, the fourth commandment. He mentions about that that was something given to them. It was not given to our fathers before, but this, is, this was given to us. So uh, again, we have then a, a distinction being made by Moses himself. So Paul is saying, 
in the New Testament that there was a time when there was no law, not, not as we're thinking, talking about it with Moses, and, uh, but then we have also Moses himself who is saying, what we're giving you in terms of this law wasn't given to your fathers. This is to us, us who came out of Egypt. And uh, so it's a very, and what we're wanting to do at this point is we want our friends to be able to kind of think, this law wasn't back there. In fact, there were human beings living on the earth without Moses' law before Moses came. So that didn't mean they weren't interacting with God. In many instances they were. It didn't mean that they weren't walking with faith and confidence toward God and seeking to do whatever he told them to do. You know, Mo, uh, you know God told Abraham to, to get out of here and go out to a land that I'm going to show you. Abraham did that. That's fine. Whatever God told him to do, Abraham did, and so did others as, as they walked with God. But to say that they had this law, they didn't. And Moses himself is saying, not even our fathers had this. God gave this to us when we came out of Egypt. So in Galatians, the third chapter, in verse 17, Paul looks at it this way. He says, what I'm trying to say, what I'm saying is this, the law, which came 430 years after labor, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise 430 years after. What is he talking about? So the law, the law, came 430 years after, Paul says. What is, after what? What is it? Yes, after that, that episode with Abraham. So the law came 430 years after. And those of you who remember the context in Galatians 3, uh, the whole business is to say the law which came later had no effect on the promise that God made David. Yes, please. You can just hear Paul's opponents saying, oh, Paul, you're saying, you know, the promise is God. Well, if you say the law is God, then you're canceling the promise, and they're, they're horrified by that. And Paul's saying, not at all. I'm not saying the promise is God. Yes. I'm saying the law is God. You can hear the argument. Thanks. So all we want to do is begin by saying, hey, the law wasn't forever. It wasn't always there. I suppose you could say it was in the mind of God, but it wasn't there in reality. It was not that God has had in mind his son, but he wasn't there in reality either. So, uh, uh, but here we're seeing different ways of looking at this, and we've even got the testimony of Moses that what he brought them in for had not been what he gave their fathers. So Abraham didn't have. So one thing you might ask your friends is, how much of the law was Abraham under? And the answer is, Abraham didn't know Moses. He wasn't at heart. Whatever Abraham did, he was doing that just between him and God. It's called faith. Wow. So, uh, in Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 20, just another uh, verse in passing along that time. Uh, the law entered. The law entered that the offense might abound. You remember all that beautiful, beautiful thing they had to say in Romans 5. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So, uh, but his point, notice that, the law entered. Yeah. It hadn't been there. Mm -hmm. So it came on the scene. So I think it's helpful if we can uh, tell our friends, it wasn't always there. In fact, we know when it did come to be, and uh, we've even got it down pretty pat. We've got it down to counting within 430 years or so. we got to work on that a little bit, but... But we're talking about 400 years after Abraham before you get to this. So I think that may help people to begin thinking. It's not so hard, folks. Don't, don't get too caught up in this. Second thought, then, is this that we might convey to them, and that is that the law came for particular purposes. It came to serve certain purposes. And again, that's not our idea. But that's what the scripture actually says. So in Galatians, the third chapter, in verse 19, 
Paul says, why then the law? Because being as it didn't help or hurt, it didn't have effect on the promises one way or the other. The promise of Abraham stood one way or the other. The law didn't affect it. So then, why did the law come at all? And Paul says, there was a reason God brought it in. Here's what Paul says. It was added, Paul's word, it was added. That means it wasn't there. Once again, just emphasizing our point. It wasn't there. It was added because of transgressions. And I think what Paul is saying is, maybe it's just this simple, maybe we don't, it doesn't have to be that hard. You have a whole nation, body of people coming out of Egypt. They had no code. They had no law. The, whatever law they had was the law of the Egyptians and whatever the, the Egyptians told them. A body, a, a civilized body of people cannot exist without some form of, of law or program. So keep in mind that when they came out, they received the law at Horeb, if you ever saying. And when they received it, it was effectively their code. It was their civil law as well as a religious law. So when Paul says it came in because of transgressions, I think maybe what Paul is saying here is a little more difficult than this. They came out of Egypt. It would have been mob rule. They had to have a, a societal norm, a program. And so what Moses gave them was to the people that came out of Egypt. And it did serve as their civil and religious law. And that's why it was added. Isn't that interesting? Apparently, it didn't need to be added before then. It was added because of those transgressions. And it was added at that time for those who came out of Egypt. So again, it might be helpful to our friends if they can understand it was added, as we've been saying. And it was added for a reason, a particular reason that God had for those people who, who came out of Egypt. And again, uh, we're reminded again about Moses himself saying, this that God gave us at Horeb was not given to your fathers. This was to us. Very interesting. So uh, another reason, I think, uh, uh, that the law came, and uh, you can decide whether it's the primary or secondary or whatever, but anyway, it's another good reason. And that is that the law came in foreshadowing, if you will, the covenant that we believe in the covenant of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, which is not the same as the law of Moses. And so what we have in Hebrews 10 and verse 1, we have uh, the writer of Hebrews saying that for the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very substance, not the very things themselves, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer, so he's talking about the sacrifices in this case, but it applies to many things. Never by the, the same sacrifice which they offer continually year by year make complete or make perfect those who belong here. So it's interesting then that the law in what it did, did lead toward Christ because the writer of Hebrews is going to tell us even the sacrifices of the law were a foreshadowing of the coming of Christ and his ultimate sacrifice. And those sacrifices were offered yearly and so on. His is offered once and for all. And that's, of course, the writer of Hebrews' point. So uh, the law came for a purpose. It came to set in order a people. They needed that. And uh, the law also, at the same time, foreshadowed what is going to be God's ultimate program. I think it's not unfair to look at Moses as being uh, a forerunner, if you will. Uh, we talk about uh, uh, John Baptist being a forerunner to Christ. There's a sense in which you could look at Moses and his foreshadowings and all the things that, that was all pointing to who? To Christ. And so, uh, as we look at that, then we can say Moses was sort of a type of Jesus, type of, typologically speaking. He's a type of Jesus. And he is, his, what he's laying out then 
points to Jesus and points to the ultimate eternal covenant that God has in mind for his people in the kingdom of God. And, uh, and uh, we're already, I think, participants in that covenant even now by Jesus Christ. So, uh, uh, but it will be ultimately realized, of course, uh, as all things will be, in the kingdom uh, when it is established. So, uh, but I, I still think it's happening. We're, we're, we're participants in a sense uh, of, that, uh, of that that Jesus is doing now and being prepared for that. So Colossians 2.17 uh, also speaks about this foreshadowing, but it says that the, the body, the substance, if you will, is Christ. And it's talking in uh, uh, Colossians uh, 2.17 about uh, uh, the various feast days and uh, Sabbaths and that, that sort of thing. And uh, these things. Christ is the substance of that. So the law was, was great. There's a sense in which the law was perfect for what it was intended to do. Moses' law, we just saw what it was supposed to do. It was going to act as a code for it, the people who came out of Egypt. It gives them uh, a basis upon which to proceed and to be a, an orderly, civilized society. It was going to encumber, or bring into it, I should say. It was going to bring into it uh, the fundamental issues about God. That was nice. That was good. Critical and even foreshadowings of the coming of the kingdom of God and of Christ. But the law is not the kingdom. It doesn't even get there. Isn't that interesting? So it's good to help people think about these things, I think. And as I say, if you can get them to thinking a bit, then it becomes not too hard. A third item that you might help your friends understand is this, that uh, the law has severe, and I emphasize severe, weaknesses, problems shortcomings. It was perfect for what it was intended to do. That was great. But in the long run, it had, it had some severe problems. One of the most severe of those problems is this. Paul says in Galatians, the third chapter and verse 21, he said, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Of course not. God wouldn't establish something contrary to, the, to his own promises he had made with Abraham. So it wasn't contrary to it. It wasn't against it. May it never be, he says. For if a law had been given, okay, which was able to, who remembers the next words? In this translation, it's impart life. Your King James, I think, will say give life. Okay. Then righteousness would have been based on the law. What is, what is Paul observing here? He's observing something very important, isn't he? He's observing that the law was not about bringing us to life. Not eternal life and not aeonian life. That's the reason I was saying a minute ago, the law was not the key. It had no bearing on us getting to the kingdom of God. It came in 430 years after the promise to Abraham. And there was no law for Abraham. Moses himself said so. Paul said so, where there was no law. So the law came in long after the promises and had no effect, Paul says, on the promises one way or the other. I think that would be impossible to argue with if you'd been uh, one of Paul's detractors. I just, you know, just sit and kind of thump your head over that because how could the law have affected it? They already had gone 430 years without it. Are you going to say that Abraham's own immediate descendants weren't going to, weren't going to make it? Because they didn't have a law. You know, it makes no sense. So the law had no effect on coming to the kingdom of God. Well, that's one of the, the areas of confusion that our friends are running into out there. Well, you've got to keep the law. If, if you're going to get... And, and, and Anthony was just mentioning that. They, if you're going to uh, have a hope of getting into the kingdom of God, you're going to, you've got to keep this law. Really? Well, it's interesting because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't. Do you think they're going to be there, or what do you think? I don't know. Do you think they're going to make it uh, into the kingdom? Yes. This is an aha moment for me here. When I say, <laughs> the law did not impart life, but then immediately think that Jesus is a life imparting spirit. Lovely. That's that's the, yes. Isn't that, isn't I like that. that. <laughs> and so uh, think of it this way, uh, and this may help your friends. Say, Moses didn't say 
John 3.16, did he? <laughs> Where do you find it? In fact, go back and reread the law. Well, work on your New Testament about the law first, but go back and, and read it. And you'll find not one word in Moses where he ever says, this is the way you're going to have unending life. This is the way you're going to have eternal life. It's not put in that perspective at all. So Paul is just is stating the obvious. Again, this would be very difficult for the Jew of Paul's day or the Jew of today who wants to proselytize back, if you will, take people uh, away from Christ back into the law. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son comes to us in this message of Christ. And uh, it's Jesus who said, I've come that they may have life, right? That's not Moses. You can wear yourself out trying to find that Moses. That may be something that would be helpful to your friends. To begin to say, oh my land, what am I doing? Yeah. So the law was portending uh, in advance, showing some of the things, at least in picture kind of ways, of what's going to come with Christ. And, and what he's going to do. But if a law could have been given, or if a law had been given that, that would have brought life, this, this life, then righteousness would have been by the law. I'm not sure Christ would have even had to have come. What do you think? I think that's another one of Paul's thoughts. Right? Wow. One other really important thought that sometimes might cause your, your friends to, uh, to think carefully, especially your uh, Gentile friends like we are, is another shortcoming of the law was it excluded us. Think about it for a moment. Do you ever think about what a big deal it was for uh, Cornelius and his, his household to become a part of this, this great enterprise of the kingdom of work of God that we're seeing now? Wow. That was a huge deal, wasn't it? That the message of the kingdom and hope would be preached to the Gentiles and that they would begin to participate in this same thing. That's tremendous. But for goodness sakes, if you were not a proselyte, you were out. I, I, I've read this, and I suppose some of you would know more accurately about it than I, but. Uh, how that uh, in uh, Herod's temple, in the, in the temple of Jesus' day, that as you went uh, from the outer court, the Gentile <coughs> court, and you went to the end of the court, uh, the, the women's court, and then so on. But anyway, from, you, from this outer court, where people like me and you are probably all Gentiles, if there's any Jews in here, that's fine. But, but, but us Gentile folks, you could only go so far, couldn't you? I understand that there was, at, at the entrances into the inner courts then, there was placards put up, permanent, that says, hey, you, if you're a Gentile, if you go beyond this point, you're going at the, uh, at the pain of death. Think about this for a minute. Wow. So the law, uh, we can think, well, you know, if I was back there, I'd just run up and participate with Moses and just have Moses might have you run out of town unless, you know, you had to become a Jew first in, in a practical and legal sense. But Gentiles overall, around the world, we were excluded. Paul says that in Ephesians 2, remember? You were without these things, right? Strangers from the, all of this. Uh, and uh, not a part of it. So, wow. So the, the law had some really significant shortcomings then. And we might want to point that out to our friends. And, uh, and let them know, hey, <laughs> we may be going the wrong direction here. Uh, where if you're going back into Moses, that's not according to the promise. That doesn't get you any closer to the kingdom of God. In fact, I think Paul would say it may move you away from it. Isn't that it? It wasn't your covenant. It wasn't your deal as a Gentile, if you're a Gentile person to begin with. And so, uh, what, you know, let's walk according to the faith of Abraham. And the faith of Abraham was this faith. He didn't have a, a, a law code. What Abraham had was, God said go. And he went. That's faith. 
It's not operating according to a code. It's operating in relationship to what God has asked him to do. So as he walked through his life, he did his best to do those things that please God. God said, I want you to take your son and offer him. Abraham went. It wasn't in some code that Abraham went and looked up. It's what God told him to do. So that's faith. That's real faith. It's, it's not faith that, you know, Abraham's sitting there in, in the land of Ur thinking, uh, God wants me to go over there to the land. Uh, I agree with him. Of course, I ain't going. <laughs> no, you know, he, he had faith in his actions, right? He had faith in his feet. But his faith was not a code faith. It wasn't like that. It was, it was a faith in God. He walked by faith in God as God gave him orders and directions. And uh, so I think, again, maybe these things can, uh, can help us. The law was only to be for a time. We, we found out it wasn't there uh, all back through time uh, until Moses came. Remember, uh, the writer John, not the writer Paul, John is going to say, for the law came by Moses. So even John's agreeing wasn't there before Moses. And uh, what is that, John 1, 17, I think? So uh, the law came by Moses, and that's John, not this fellow Paul that everybody gets all irritated and exercised about. But, the, uh, but John is saying the law came by Moses. But what grace and truth came, the grace and the truth that we experienced came by Jesus Christ. We can walk like this fellow back here, Abraham walked. You want to talk about the faith of Abraham? It means walking like he walked. Not according to the code with hundreds and hundreds of particulars. He didn't have that. That was like 430 years old. But Abraham did have his relationship and his walk with God, and so he did. There are ways in which our walk in this new testament is more in harmony with what Abraham did and the walk that he had. We're getting orders too. Our orders come from Jesus Christ and to his people and to his church. Our orders come to him through his word that he has written. But Jesus wasn't really developing a Moses kind of code. 